and I'd like to welcome, on behalf of all of us, Professor Tari Turner for this next presentation called Living on the Edge, Exploring Possible Futures of Evidence Synthesis. I think there's something in it for many of us in the room. Now, Tari leads research developing and evaluating methods for living evidence syntheses, which I know is close to many people's hearts here, including living systematic reviews and also living guidelines. Um, and translating synthesised evidence into improved health practice and policy. Tari is co-editor-in-chief of the BMC journal Health Research Policy and Systems, published in collaboration with the World Health Organisation, and is also a member of the Scientific and Technical Advisory Group to the WHO Department of Reproductive Health and Research. Uh, and on that score, please join me in welcoming Tari Turner. Please, Tari. Thanks, Ed, and thank you very much, everybody. Um, I feel really privileged to be invited to come and speak to you this afternoon. Um, and I want to just start by um, acknowledging the Indigenous owners of the lands in which we meet, um, and I understand that's the Ghana people here, and to acknowledge their elders, past and present, and my respects for their ongoing connection to land, sea and sky. And also to acknowledge the Indigenous elders of the uh, lands I'm coming to you from, the Boonwurrung people uh, on the outer east of Nam or Melbourne in Victoria. Um, the reason the trees are on the screen is twofold. Once, one to remind me that this is where I live and I'm very fortunate to live there. The other to remind me that I have caramello koalas. <laughs> um, so Friday afternoon after lunch, I get it. Um, and I do think what I have to say is important, but even if it's not, if you um, feel like you're struggling at any point and just need a chocolate, let me know. And there will be chocolates for questions along the way. So just to kick off proceedings, would anybody like a chocolate? <laughs> right, here we go. It's that easy, folks. All right, so I arrived on Wednesday night and came straight from the hotel to the Adelaide Zoo. And I have to say that I had the feeling, walking in at the Adelaide Zoo, that I had entered a family reunion and that I was the new girlfriend of one of the cousins. <laughs> and I had met very few of you. Um, and so I want to become part of the family and I'm trying to accelerate that process. Um, and I was reflecting after Jack welcomed us yesterday to country of the importance of names and what they tell us about a person. So I thought I'd tell you a few of my names as a way of kind of introducing me to your family. So um, the blonde lad uh, up there is my son, Oscar. He is the best co-production project I've ever been involved with. Uh, he calls me mum. Uh, the taller guy uh, is my husband, Simon, who is very helpfully for me a biostatistician. Um, and he calls me Tej. Now, those of you who are from outside Australia may not recognise the importance of name shortening in Australia. All Australians must have their names shortened. Um, my name is Tari. My second name is Joy. So those close to me call me TJ, but that is really too long for an Aussie. So my immediate family call me Tej. Um, Peter Bragg. You are not allowed to call me Tej. Just ruling that out right now. I have another name in mind. <laughs> <laughs> the middle image there is an, uh, an image of a Pollyanna ninja. I spent a couple of years working for a large Australian international development agency um, that I won't name because I'm about to defame them. Um, and my colleagues there called me the Pollyanna ninja. Some of you will be familiar with the Pollyanna story. It was a movie in the 1960s. And Pollyanna is described as someone who is endlessly talkative and rad radically optimistic. And I'll take that on both fronts. The ninja bit is a bit harder to describe, but there was a time in this organisation where our other NGOs in Australia were being described as our competitors. I have a real problem with that. I think that people who are working on international development from Australia are all collaborators. And I may or may not have allegedly expressed that by defacing posters across the organisation. <laughs> Pollyanna Ninja, I will get things done. 
The third image is an image um, of a name that was given to me by a previous boss, uh, the wonderful Claire Harris, who referred to me as an intellectual butterfly. Uh, and again, you could take that a couple of ways, but what I, how I'm choosing to interpret that is that I'm interested in lots of things. I'm not a specialist. I'm not a person who goes in depth in a very narrow field. I'm interested in all sorts of shiny, interesting things, like text, reviews of textual stuff. How fascinating. Um, and I'm much more interested in how I can help than being methodologically pure. So I'm putting that right out there. So the plan for the next little while is to give you a bit of an update on where I think we are now, living on the edge right now. Then I want to talk about what I think is coming around the corner, what's pretty soon that you should be prepared for, and what maybe the slightly more distant future looks like. I started out in academia working in multimedia and IT, and we referred to this as the bleeding edge, as opposed to the leading edge place where things get dangerous. But I'm very aware that prophecy is a dicey thing. It's really difficult to tell the future, as Ken Olsen found out in 1977 when he predicted that no one would want a computer in their home or their handbag, just saying. Um, so I offer this as my thoughts and my suggestions, but I don't pretend I know. There's also another story that goes around that in 1943, uh, Thomas Watson, who was then the chair of IBM, said that there was maybe a world market for five computers. Now, this may or may not be an urban myth. The thing is, Twitter slash X did not exist when Ken did or didn't say this, so there's no proof. So um, I was tempted to ask you not to tweet anything I say today just so I have plausible deniability. <laughs> so let's warm up by talking about where we are now. Obviously, I'm going to talk about living evidence. That's my thing at the moment. Then I want to talk about global collaboration. And then I want to talk about machine learning and AI before we get to what's coming up a bit further ahead. So I expect that many of you have been bored by this concept of living evidence. But for those of you who are not quite so familiar, the general premise is essentially that we all do beautiful living systematic reviews, well, sorry, beautiful systematic reviews, beautiful guidelines. We spend all that effort to finding the question, doing the searching, screening, data extraction, synthesis, publishing, and then we pop it out there, in nature, of course, and it rapidly loses currency. In fact, probably it's not current when we first get it published. And as a result, these reviews can be less than useless. The idea of the living model is we do all the same things at the beginning. We ask the question, we do the search, we do the rigorous processes, but once we've climbed that mountain, we don't walk away. We keep doing the surveillance, we keep doing the um, updating. I'm gonna come back to why there are lots of caveats around this. Uh, and some of them Maureen raised yesterday, and I agree with her on all fronts. But let's talk a little bit more about living evidence first. So over the last five years, or even less, there's been a massive upswing in the application of living approaches. Pre-2020, there were a few of us talking about living evidence. There were probably two living guidelines in the world, and there were less than two dozen systematic, living systematic reviews. But the pandemic really just absolutely crystallized why we need up-to-date evidence now. Um, so WHO has recently said that they're gonna make all their guidance living Big job for Lisa Raskey. NICE has a pillar in their corporate plan that says their guidance is going to be living. And happily, Australia's really led the way in living evidence. So the Australian Living Evidence Consortium, now the Australian Living Evidence Collaboration, because we've just got a lot bigger, involved a lot more partners, um, and the task force I'm going to touch on very briefly. So this is our website. Um, the Australian Living Evidence Collaboration. We're a collaboration of 46 health sector organisations developing living guidance. Um, we've got guidance currently in pregnancy and postnatal care, COVID, stroke, diabetes, kidney disease, arthritis, uh, and more to come. Our most familiar work 
was the National Clinical Evidence Task Force for COVID. I have to say, this was the best piece of work I have ever had the privilege to be a part of. It was absolutely astonishing, and I never, ever want to do it ever again. <laughs> um, we developed living COVID guidelines. Um, our first publication was 3rd or 4th of April 2020. We're still arguing about that. Um, and what really made it magnificent were our member organisations. We had 35 member organisations representing all the clinicians who were delivering care for people with COVID across Australia. Allied health, nursing, doctors, pharmacists, the whole lot. We had 16 expert panels comprising more than 250 clinicians and consumers who regularly reviewed the evidence and developed recommendations. Between, oh there you go, I've said third on this slide, third of April and when we shut, the, shut down the task force, we had 134 updates of the guideline, including 74 updates where at least one recommendation was changed. We grew to include 200 recommendations, which covered treatment, prevention, respiratory support, ICU support, care during pregnancy, and uh, care for children and adolescents. Um, and my team still laugh at me because when they was, it was suggested that we do clinical flow charts, I said, that's a really bad idea. Turns out I was terribly wrong. It was a very good idea and clinicians loved them. I've been working in guidelines for a very long time and I'm very familiar with the idea that it takes us two years to develop a guideline and then we print out the document and we put it on the shelf. And I've spent a lot of time worrying about the amount of effort that goes into guideline development. For what impact? And it was such an honour to be part of a project where we had direct impact. We had almost um, over 700,000 people using the website from more than 200 countries and territories, which is very close to being everywhere. Um, we had those flowcharts that I thought were a bad idea were downloaded more than 150,000 times and we had 1.7 million page views. What's fascinating about this to me is that the usage of the guideline tracked with outbreaks of COVID in Australia. We could see as hospitalisations rose, the use of our guidelines rose. Um, as sadly deaths rose, the use of our guidelines rose. It was astonishing. Steve McDonald, who many of you knew, know, um, run, ran daily evidence searches for us. We often updated these guidelines weekly. We had multiple panels meeting many nights a week. It was extraordinary. It also just about killed us. Um, it was, as I said, a great honour, but I will never do that again. And I hope we never have reason to. We've moved on now to developing uh, pregnancy and postnatal care guidelines. This is our newest baby, our first, literally, huh, um, our first guideline recommendation came out just a couple of weeks ago. If you've got a view on how women should be advised around their use of alcohol during pregnancy, please go and tell us what you think that should be. Um, and happily, we're not doing daily or weekly. We're still arguing whether it's maybe monthly searches here. Um, which brings me a little bit to this point of living evidence. I do think living evidence is important, but I think it's not about the brand, living, which has become incredibly um, popular. Everybody wants everything to be living all the time. It's much more about uh, what Ruth and Maureen were talking about, which is making sure that the evidence people want is up to date when they need it. For some questions, I'm thinking maybe after Noah's talk yesterday, that might be around audit feedback. We might not need to be updating reviews very frequently at all. The evidence is not changing, it's stable. If you need to know whether your asthmatic child requires Ventolin, Selbutamol, we probably don't need a living review on that. We know it works, we could just leave it where it was. In COVID, when new stuff was coming out literally every day, we needed very frequent updates. But we haven't done daily searches for COVID since April and there has been no significant trial published in that period. Probably those guidelines don't need to be living anymore. 
And so I think it would be helpful for us to have a more nuanced conversation uh, than rather than say everything should be living. And I'll come back to that a bit later. If I haven't put you off living and you'd like to know more, we have a Living Guidelines Handbook, which is available on our webpage. Um, and there was a series of papers published in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology earlier in the year, um, reporting on what we learned from COVID in collaboration with our colleagues at NICE and at the US Grade Working Group, who also were doing living COVID guidelines in that period. One of the best moments for me in that COVID experience, and there were many good ones, was we were approached by NICE, the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence in the UK, about 12 months in to our guideline development program. And they said, look, we're looking to set up a living guideline for COVID treatment. Can you help us? And we said, yeah. And we gave them all of our evidence, all the evidence summaries we've done, all the summary of findings tables, all the magic content. We said, take it and use it. And they did. And the first version of their NICE guidelines was based on the evidence work that our team had done. And I just thought, that is so how it should be. This is how collaboration should work. We've done the work. There's no benefit to us keeping the doors closed. We should share this stuff. Um, so uh, building on that, and Ruth is the person to talk to if you want to know more about this, um, there's now a global initiative called ALIVE, the Alliance for Living Evidence, which is aiming to create more of these collaborations where we can share the work of evidence synthesis so that it doesn't need to be duplicated, doesn't need to be repeated. We can focus our efforts, to Maureen's point, in other places. We don't need to be repeating this work. Uh, and we've established some additional collaborations around diabetes and we're looking for more. Um, so, I'll step slightly aside from living evidence for a bit to talk about um, what we've already talked about a few times uh, over the course of the last couple of days, um, AI. So we are already using AI. Um, I sometimes get a little bit frustrated because we go like, oh my goodness, AI. I'm like, yeah, but we've been doing this for a while. Um, now that you can use ChatGPT to create a haiku about meta-analysis, this is actually not a massive shift right now. Um, this image here, this disturbing image, was created by AI. It was my first AI image that I generated, and I was very proud of it, until my son, Oscar, who you met earlier, pointed out that it has far too many fingers. Um, and that gets even more disturbing, which kind of highlights the problem. So we do have machine learning tools um, based on AI approaches are in stuff we already use all the time. If you ever search central, you are using the output of an AI process. Machine, language, machine learning models are built in. Um, if you use Covidence ever, machine learning models are built into the fabric of that stuff now, which is great. Um, and there are more complex um, iterations of AI coming for absolutely sure. And I reckon that on balance, they'll make our lives better. And I'll talk a little bit later about what I think that might look like. Um, but every day, I would choose Steve McDonald over any AI thing right now. Right now, AI is not replacing human expertise. OK, so that was where we are now. You guys already knew all of that. What's coming next? Uh, I think in the good news, bad news story, What's coming next is all the stuff that's going to require hard work from us. I was really excited at the Cochrane collaboration meeting um, to see a really increased focus on equity, diversity and inclusion. And it was fantastic to hear Catherine talking about it yesterday and the work that's happening here too. Uh, it's great. This is not new work, but it is getting legs and getting momentum now. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. I also think there's some great work for us to be doing around engagement consumers and policymakers, the non-effectiveness components of evidence to decision frameworks for those who are working on guidelines, publication, and vitally KT and implementation, and I'll talk about each of those. So why do I say AI can't help us um, with this stuff? So I went to my um, AI image generator and put in living evidence team. And this is what it came out with. Um, so if we put to the side, the very bad hair. Um, 
this is four white 20-something men. Um, and essentially, with some small exceptions, AI is being generated right now by white 25 to 35 year old men, apparently with bad hair. <laughs> Can't confirm or deny. Um, and all of the AI applications are being driven off an evidence base that is white, that is high income, and that is problematic. I'm sure it will improve over time. So if I put in diverse living evidence team in my image generator, I get this, which is more diverse, though the bad hair remains. Um, so I, there's hope, but there's not a lot of, lot of hope. So at the Cochrane meeting, we spoke a lot about equity, diversity, and inclusion. And this isn't new to me. It's stuff that we've been working on for a while. But I was really struck by how deep the challenges are for us to wrestle with in the future in this space. Um, one of the examples that was given at the Cochrane meeting was of the APGAR score. So many of you will be very familiar with the APGAR score. This is the score that is used to um, assess pretty much every newborn baby wherever they're delivered in the world. How well is this baby? Um, and you'll see in the top left hand corner of that, you score a two if you're pink. There are a lot of babies born every day that are not pink. Um, and pink would be a problem for many of those babies. But our, fundamentally, our, at the very basic levels, our whole system is based off really undiverse everything. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lack of diversity of the populations in research. There's poor reporting of diversity characteristics. We really don't understand how many of these things will impact on the generalizability of the reviews that we're doing every day. Um, and as Kasia mentioned yesterday, that methodological guidance is coming along, so this has been taking a little while. We did some work I mentioned on this in the um, COVID guidelines. And we looked at the 115 randomised controlled trials that our guidance had used to base its recommendations on. We pulled out those 115 studies and we looked at to what extent they'd reported on diversity characteristics. Um, so 115 of them told us that where the geographical location was of the study. And then there's a rapid fall. 109 of them told the age like that is already six studies not telling us how old the patients were in their study. 108 of them couldn't tell us the gender of the participants. Um, and then if we start to get into ethnicity, less than a third of them told us the ethnicity of the populations in a context where we know that people with different ethnic backgrounds were having different outcomes, largely driven, driven by social determinants of health. There was literally nothing on employment status, migrant status, income status, education status, or disability in 115 RCTs driving all treatment for patients with COVID. I kind of don't even, like, wow. Wow. So our reviews need to be record, reporting equity characteristics. Even if we're only reporting, it wasn't reported. We need to be reporting this stuff. This is vital, vital. I find myself talking, not surprisingly, about living evidence all the time. Um, and I find myself saying, it's totally not rocket science, right? This is just the same stuff you do every day. It's just that you now do it every day. It's nothing magic here. It's not rocket science. But. The best thing about living evidence approaches is that they provide new opportunities for us to have in-depth, ongoing conversations that allow us to build the trusting, credible relationships uh, and to evolve our research work to make sure it meets the needs of users, as was highlighted in the last setting. If you're doing a living review, you don't, at the end of the day, fold it into an airplane and fire it at a policymaker. You spend the whole time talking to them. This is what we're finding now. Is that helpful? Oh, you'd rather us look at that other thing. Okay, well, let's change that. We can work that in. How, is this helpful? Oh, we hadn't thought about that. You're right. We can update the review and you can have the next version. And it's those kinds of engagements that make the living evidence stuff worthwhile. Um, we've done a little bit of work around um, iterative design of con with consumers. 
We've got um, quite complex methods of consumer engagement in our living guidelines, led by uh, co-Adelaidean Annie Sinnott, who is schmick, um, and we want to do a lot more work in this space. Uh, and Sam Chakraborty is leading up our work around engagement with policymakers. In 2021, on um, what some people call Australia Day, some people call Survivor Day, I was at a barbecue at my friend's place. This is a public holiday. Um, and we were just, you know, trying not to yell at the kids and waiting for the sausages to be, co to be cooked. And I got a call on my phone from the Def Deputy Chief Medical Officer. I've never got a call on my phone from the Deputy Chief Medical Officer. Um, and I went into their study and I closed the door and I sat in the floor and talked to Michael Kidd about the guideline recommendation that was coming out on Monday. And he said to me, you know what, could you just hold off till Wednesday um, because then I can brief my staff on Monday so that when we start getting complaints about your recommendation on Wednesday, they know what to say. And I was just like, uh-huh, yep, we can do that. Because this is the kind of conversation we can have once we've done the months of work to establish that we have a relationship. Um, and I just I cannot emphasise enough that that's the bit about living methods that makes it worth doing, the engagement with the users. This is a really complex picture that we're still trying to refine to make clearer, but it emphasises this kind of thing, particularly with policymakers. There's no predictable cycle about when something will be important, when an issue matters to a policymaker. You know, it depends on what was on the front page of the Herald Sun. What's the equivalent of the Herald Sun in Adelaide? Sorry? The advertiser. The advertiser. Thank you. Um, it depends on who their boss spoke to over the weekend. It depends on a whole lot of stuff. But a living review is always ready to respond to a policymaker. It's up to date when they want it. And this is the kind of thing we're trying to set up. Um, a shout out to the other types of reviews. We talk a lot, particularly in Cochrane, and I know you guys have a much more diverse view, about benefits and harms, about interventions. And I think we need to think a lot more about living implications for other parts of an evidence to decision framework. Um, how do we think about these other things like equity, acceptability, feasibility in a living mode? Um, and there's so much to unpack there. If you haven't had a play with WHO Integrate and you're interested in evidence to decision frameworks, I encourage you to have a look at that. It's a different way of thinking about it and I think that's going to help me in the future but I don't have an answer yet. Um, I'm going to come next to the piece that David was talking about, which is really about the publication element. Um, somebody asked, is the publication system broken? Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, it was mentioned as I came up that I was previously the co-editor-in-chief of BMC Journal um, Health Research Policy and Systems. So like David, I feel very comfortable doing some editor bashing because I am, I am one of them. Um, but the publishing and academic model is just like totally broken. Um, just as an example of this, Springer Nature, which by the way owns the BMC journal um, portfolio, in 2021 their revenue was $1.7 billion. Uh, and their profit was $443 million. Uh, Euros, sorry, so like double that for the Aussies in the room. Like, what? Um, I can tell you precisely how much I was earning as the co-editor-in-chief of the journal I was working on um, with absolute confidence intervals from zero to zero. Um, but somebody is making a lot of money out of all of your work. Um, the publication model is broken. I'm going to come to some other models um, too. So David mentioned preprints in his talk. I do feel like he was stealing a little bit of my thunder. We'll have a conversation afterwards, David. Um, preprints are a thing. Um, and he alluded to the fact that there's increasing research coming out now that there's actually no difference, no fundamental difference between the results of preprints and the results of the subsequent published trials. And this was our experience in the COVID guidelines too. 
we decided early on that we would include preprints. And when the published trial came out, we then compared and said, do we need to change any of our content as a result? The answer was no, except for one occasion where we had to update the included number of participants by three. Um, so like preprints, definitely a thing. Also, as Maureen and I were talking about earlier, it's an indictment of the peer review model. There is a lot of time being spent here. And um, there are other models. So uh, F1000, for those who um, are not aware, they do a post-publication peer review, essentially. You, if, if they accept your work, it's put up on the web, and then people peer review it over time. Um, eLife also has a, a slightly different model. Now, how can I, can I go backwards? Yes, OK. Um, publication model, broken. It also doesn't enable living publication. So there are very few journals which are able to publish living systematic reviews at the moment. Um, I actually don't know how JBI handles this in your journals. We don't yet. Um, Cochrane, in theory, does, right? Cochrane's had a model in the past where you had an update to a review. It works a little bit, but it's not there yet. And there's a whole lot of complex issues in there, like DOIs and citation tracking, and what do we do if the author team changes from one version to the other. There's also just a whole lot of simple process stuff, like if it's a new version, we probably don't need to do full peer review. We could just review those sections that have changed. I think this is a solvable problem. I think we will solve it soon. Um, research integrity issues. Some of you will be um, familiar with the work that's been done by Zarko and his team at Cochrane Pregnancy and Childbirth. They looked at 18 uh, Cochrane systematic reviews of nutrition interventions during pregnancy, and they pulled all the randomised control trials out of those reviews and assessed them for the likelihood that they were fraudulent. I think they called it problematic to avoid being sued. Um, and then they looked at if we excluded all the studies that we thought were probably not actual studies, what impact would that have on the systematic reviews? Uh, and in one third of those reviews, it would change the conclusion of the review. If you're not thinking about the integrity of the research that you're including, if you're not thinking about whether that data is valid, if you're not thinking about whether that might be a fraudulent slash problematic study, I have some bad news for you. Uh, this is also really bad news for me because we're doing pregnancy guidelines and we'd hope to use Zarko's reviews, but we're working on it. Um, and I think um, Ruth flagged in her discussion, there are perverse incentives around academic publication, whether it's being encouraged to publish on your own, uh -huh, um, or to publish in high impact journals that are actually not read by the people in your field. Um, there's a whole lot of other stuff there. So I think we need to fix this. And um, Maureen flagged the issues of KT and implementation, and this is a live conversation with my team. We now think we know how to develop living guidelines, but we actually don't know how to implement them. And that's a pretty big problem. Um, no guideline, no matter how excellent, uh, helps from the shelf. No systematic review, no matter how beautiful, no matter how absolutely ideal, helps from the shelf. I think we have a lot to learn, and I'm really optimistic that we will learn in the very near future how we deal with some of these issues that new methods are throwing up. I was thinking about this in the context of the textual, reviews of textual evidence. How do we deal with the increased uncertainty that those new methods bring in? There's real richness in that, but we don't quite know how to interpret that. What does that mean for implementation? How do we deal with issues around credibility and trust? If people in the advertiser, are reading that one third of Cochrane Pregnancy Nutrition Reviews are based on studies which are probably fraudulent, that has some implications for trust in research evidence. We don't want people to stop using research evidence. How do we handle that conversation? Um, my favourite living guidelines thing is people are like, oh my goodness, living guidelines are going to be a nightmare to implement. The recommendations are going to go this way and then next week that way and then next week this way. Doesn't happen. Spoiler alert, we've got a, we've got a paper coming about that but it does have real implications for how we think about implementing. Um, and I really think that very soon we're gonna to have to work out how we feed this evidence into the workflows of other people, whether it's electronic health records, 
uh, whether it's the workflows of policymakers, this is not about asking them to change the way they work. This is about working out how we can work better to fit into their work. So, talked about where we are now. I've talked about what we need to do next. Now I want to talk about what I think is the big stuff. So the bleeding edge bit, sidebar, I'm also the ethics chair for Red Cross Lifeblood. That's their logo, donate whenever you have the opportunity. AI will change everything and nothing. I'm gonna explain that on the next slide. Don't tweet it. Um, I think there's a really interesting thing that we need to think about, which is living qualitative evidence synthesis. I'm gonna talk about how little I know about that in two slides time. And then I think we need to think about changing the whole thing. What is this we're doing? What are we delivering? Why are we here? Friday afternoon, 2 p.m., we can do it. Okay, so I think that AI is gonna change a whole lot of stuff. I think it's going to mean that we are asked to do more. When it's no longer a problem to screen 17,000 studies for a review, for cardiovascular predictors, for example, we're not gonna get that time back. You and I are not gonna be on a tram to Glenelg Beach because we've just done that, we've left that to the machine. I think we're gonna be asked to do scarier, more complex, more sophisticated things instead. John Maynard Keynes said um, that he expected that by 2030, we would all be only working 15 hours a week because machines would be doing everything. Um, we've got seven years, but I'm not thinking that's likely. I think that as AI frees up the stuff that AI is really good at doing, human brains are gonna be asked to do more complex things. I think that's good news, although I wouldn't mind the 15 hour work week thing too. Either way is good. Um, one thing we're really interested in is whether guideline chatbots, AI, could be developed to help do some of the translation work for us. So um, most AI at the moment is, is focused on large language models. It's designed to deal with textual information, which most of our guidelines and systematic reviews end up being. Um, so there's actually really great potential that AI will be better than us at converting the technical documents that we produce into something that's useful for users who maybe don't bring to it our technical lens. I think that's a thing. Um, and for the same reasons, and kind of connecting to what you were saying, I think that AI will be really good at the kind of narrative synthesis stuff that we're starting to talk about. It won't replace us, but I think it'll help us to be able to extract data and work out what the complex themes are. Um, some of you know Steve, I've mentioned him a few times, Steve McDonald. Um, he thinks the main purpose of AI in the next little while is going to be helping us clean up the horrible junk that AI is also going to be creating. We're already seeing a whole lot of stuff out in the um, internet, which is just, I don't know what that is, but we're going to need some help working out what's fact, what's fiction. Uh, and AI might be helpful with that. Um, This is like a Sunday afternoon uh, discussion point for me. What is living qualitative evidence synthesis? I'm a mixed methods researcher, so I don't aim, you know, I'm, I'm a pragmatist and uh, I'm certainly not a qualitative specialist, but I don't think what we're doing for lots of evidence reviews works for qualitative reviews in living. We're not aiming to be comprehensive so it doesn't make sense necessarily that we want to include every study. If it's a new study, what do we do with that? How are, what are our criteria for including new qualitative evidence in a qualitative synthesis? I don't know. Uh, and then what do we do with the mixed methods bit? Hmm, I don't know. Um, cleverer people than me are thinking about this at the moment, so we're starting to make some progress, I think, um, but we're a little ways off. Uh, and I'm hanging around Adelaide for the weekend, so if you have any ideas on Sunday afternoon um, and you'd like to share a glass of Barossa Red. My final 
big thing before I get to some wrap-ups is this idea of a joined-up system. Um, for those of you who are not Australians or haven't had the opportunity, the picture in the bottom corner is from what in Melbourne, Nam, we call the castle and what people in Adelaide here in Ghana country call the castle. Um, it's a movie about my people. These are working class Bogan Australians and uh, forgive me for those of you who don't know what Bogan is, I can explain that later. Um, and the catchphrase from this, line, from this film is, tell him he's dreaming. And this is me. Tell me I'm dreaming. But what I dream of is a system, an ecosystem, in which everything talks to everything else and where we can continually be updating it. So Ian Shemelt, who's based in the UK, some of you know, he was reminding me of how bizarre a system we have. So currently we do a big trial and then we take two days, David, to write up the, the, res the results of that trial and we put it in a PDF. And then the next team comes along and they do a big search to find those PDFs and then they pull all the data out of those PDFs and they take them through RevMan or equivalent software and create a review which they put into a PDF. And then a guideline developer comes along and does a big search to find all the systematic reviews and pulls out the data and takes it to a guideline panel and does all sorts of weird stuff to it and then puts it in a PDF. And I feel like maybe you can spot it, there might be some issues with that system. I feel like if we could move, as Ian says, from a documents in, documents out system to a data in, data out system, which allowed all of those pieces to talk to each other, we might be able to move to something that was more efficient. We might also move from being able to take 47 randomised control trials in slightly different populations with slightly different characteristics, pull them all together and say, on average, this. Um, I was going to offer you a chocolate if you were the average patient. But none of us in this room is the average patient. If we had the IPD, the, in, the individual patient data, and then we could summarise it and synthesise it and tag it, then I could go to my GP and say, OK, I'm not the average um, patient. I'm a significantly taller patient. I've got these other health issues. What about for people like me? Could we pull out the people like me from that study? How confident would you be that that intervention would work for me? Um, and then we could use that data to drive trial design, right? So that, oh, we don't know what it's like for women because all of our studies were done in men, not an unusual situation. Maybe we could design a trial that actually looked at the impact of that intervention in women or in a different context. Um, I recognise I'm dreaming, but it's a good dream. And when People, cleverer people like Ian Shemelt are thinking about it. Um, and this is to remind me to be humble. This is a picture that uh, Julian and Elliot and I designed in a very technological tool called PowerPoint um, that was in our first living evidence paper in 2014. It was a good idea 10 years ago <laughs> and it's still a good idea. We need to get the system joined up. So wrapping up. Uh, Yogi Berra said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Uh, and ultimately, I might be right about some of this stuff, I might be wrong about some of this stuff, but the future isn't really ours to predict, it's ours to make. It's all of our job to work out what our big dream is and to work out what little steps we can take to making that dream a reality. And I thought I'd, I'd finish by... Um, showing you a non-AI picture of the actual living evidence team. This is um, the living evidence team at Monash. Um, and uh, all the good ideas in this, com in this conversation this afternoon came from them. All the bad ideas are mine. But together, we're trying to work out which are which and make it happen. Thanks. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Tari. Please join me. We have some time for questions and some thoughts, comments. I'd like to just start, starting with the living bit. There's a few questions that have come through on the chat as well. Um, 
many people in this room invest in systematic reviews, um, understand the size of the effort, the time it takes to do a systematic review. Acknowledging that, we've all had this flash through our minds of, wow, what about a living review? Yeah. And then suddenly cringe and say, ooh, I don't know about that one. Yeah. You've presented here a successful model, but it's a consortium. Yeah. You know, either the, can, can you speak a little bit to the realities of resource implications? Is it something that a small group of us who normally might work three or four of us doing a systematic review, yeah. are we being real? Or do we, is it this sort of model that's required? I think, um, yes, both. And I think it comes a little bit, Ruth mentioned um, yesterday, there's definitely a model which is like, we get a group of people that's diverse, that's larger than your normal three to four person review team, and you have them work in spurts. So one thing that we are finding is it's still just as hard to climb that mountain. It's still just as hard to do that initial evidence synthesis. It still takes all the same work, because it is the same work. Um, but many of you have been, will have been involved in a process where you've subsequently you've done a review, you've come back five years later to do the update, and it's actually just as hard again. You know, it, there's no, you, have to, you may as well start from scratch. Um, and our experience is that for reviews where you're going to do an update, it is actually easier to stay up there on the escarpment uh, and just do the day-to-day. Uh, the -day. We, we had this conversation in the context of COVID where we were doing daily searches which again, I would never recommend to anyone ever. And we said, well, maybe we should make that a weekly search thing. And our team said, no, actually, <laughs> it takes me half an hour every morning, but if we did it once a week, it would take me four hours. And it's more efficient for me to do the little bits frequently. So I think there are some efficiency gains, and I think it's very much dependent on the context. If you're going to be running a monthly search, it's actually not that much additional work, especially in an area where you're not expecting there to be 78 new trials. And if you're expecting there to be 78 new trials, you need a whole different approach. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So that actually segues very neatly into a question by Lisa Hopp, and you may have answered some of it, but the question here is, and Lisa, you've just earned yourself a chocolate. Yes, thank you please. very much. How do we know, and for those of you who ask anonymous questions, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> How do we know whether the living review should be fast living, and you just mentioned that, or slow living? In other words, how do you judge the cycle length that will make a difference yep. to providers, policy makers, et cetera? And some of it will make a difference to the review team also, like you just alluded to. Yep. And does it matter? Does that length of time? Yeah, it's a really great question. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I think really doing the review the first time gives you a sense of that. So we, people who are coming to us and asking this question for their living review, I'm about to do a living review on topic X, what frequency should I put into the protocol, for example, we say, well, run the search and look at how many have come out over the last six months. That'll give you a sense of the likely flow of evidence. It's not perfect, but it gives you a sense of what's going to happen for the next six months. And that will give you a sense of whether a six monthly update or a two monthly update is going to be more appropriate. Um, I think to the, the second best thing about living approaches is that kind of shock horror for a systematic review methodology, you can change your methods along the way. So you, you can do a, you know, a monthly cycle for so long and then decide actually, you know what, let's, let's move to a three monthly cycle. Update your protocol, explain your rationale, be transparent, change your methods. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, interesting question. So, you mentioned variability in the quality of published studies, and this is a chocolate for Zoe Jordan, please. Uh, would you ex... I beg your pardon, okay. <laughs> would you exclude a study from analysis in a systematic review based on the quality of the study? So, in part, there are methods of sensitivity analysis, the like you yep. can do. Does that all hold true for living as well? Yeah. So, um, there are increasingly tools that are being used to assess the kind of... not 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 a critical appraisal tool, but a how likely is this piece of research to be actually a piece of research. And there are tools that help us make those assessments. Um, Zarka and his team have developed some. There are others internationally developing some. Um, and I think it, on, the, on balance, the sensitivity analysis approach is probably a good approach. But there are some teams, uh, some pieces of research that are so clearly fraudulent that including them is I think unethical. You know, there are studies where the average length of the pregnancy of the women involved is 11 months. Now, I'm sorry, but I can't include, like, I think we should be having a conversation with the authors. Sorry, if we look at the 
duration of pregnancy here, it's 11 months. Can you, is that a mistake? Can you help me? But if we can't get that clarified, I can't include that. Like, I think we have to be transparent and, and it's you know, situation dependent. Um, I think, you know, if a study's retracted, we should be excluding it. But the process of retraction, and David uh, alluded to this, is so unreliable and so long. Um, you know, there were studies who were retracted in COVID nine months after the expression of concern. Um, and in the COVID guidelines, we had to make a decision. Like, actually, if we think this is problematic, we're excluding it because it, it impacts on patient care. Um, and there's a risk either way. But I th so I think, you know, that, that it is situation dependent, but I think that in many of these cases, people are using the results of our reviews to guide practice and policy decisions. If we are not confident that the results are reliable, then it is actually our responsibility to say, I'm sorry, yeah. can't include it. That segues beautifully into the next question. Sorry, this one's anonymous, so no chocolate for anyone, I'm afraid. Um, how do you track and manage articles that have been retracted? Does living offer better opportunity or better able to manage these issues compared to just the static living uh, um, systematic review? Yeah, so we, um, we search retraction watch on a, on a regular basis to identify newly retracted studies. And I think actually whether you're doing a living review or just an update of a standard review, that should be part of our core process. Every time we do an update of a review, we should search retraction watch. That's um, a basic requirement. We also use Twitter and X and other things to identify studies that people are flagging as problematic and then to use one of the tools that I've mentioned before to assess the reliability of those studies. Um, and I think increasingly we just have to use a research integrity assessment tool as part of the standard process for any review. And also just a point to note, um, I think you should do that retrospectively. If you're gonna update a new review, it's not enough just to look whether your new studies have any issues, expressions of concern, you need to search retraction watch for your included studies too. Um, it's a scary percentage of included studies that are in retraction watch that the, are never identified because they're retracted after the systematic review was conducted. Yes. Okay, I'll just, you've clearly worked with many guideline groups, guideline panels, and there one of your slides said it's not just about benefits and harms. Yeah. Um, the few guideline panels I've had the opportunity to work with inevitably it has, when it comes to the evidence, it has been about benefits and harms. Yeah. And you mentioned there are other parts of the evidence to decision framework, and there the living qualitative synthesis came, it was mentioned at the end. Are you seeing a shift in working with guideline panels, a refocus, because that requires greater resources, greater funding, more time, more energy. Yeah. Is it coming around? Yeah. I think it is. Um, and it was really exciting moment for us on one, um, one of the COVID guideline panels, maybe 12 months into the process where we're developing a recommendation. There's a section, for those of you who don't know, in an evidence decision framework in a guideline, there's a section on patient preferences and values, um, which is usually kind of cursorily filled in. We write in a sentence or two about that and move on. Um, Annie Sinnott had been working with us to develop up a great consumer panel and we're having a conversation around primarily the benefits and harms, but other elements of this recommendation. And the chair of our guidelines leadership group said, I'm not comfortable this needs to go back to the consumer panel. They need to tell us what goes here because we can't make a recommendation without it. And I thought, okay, you know, for a long time, there's been an expectation that you'll have two consumers on your guideline leadership group and you'll tick that box on the NHMRC approval. But I think there is a shift. People are saying, you know what? We actually do want to hear from the consumers. Um, I think equity, the equity component of the ETD is increasingly important. We saw that again in our work where um, different populations were at greater risk and had different access to drugs. Um, those of us who were in Melbourne had a different experience of COVID from people who were in other areas. I think the, the guideline groups wanted to think about that, um, but it does take, it takes more resources to do consumer involvement well. It, you know, we've, we've only ever done, don't tweet this, one qualitative evidence synthesis to inform the ETD because it does take loads of time and that's why I think we need to put more work into doing it well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, go to the floor in just a moment. Just one last question from me, feeding on from that. Yesterday, Maureen showed us the pyramid. Mm -mm. Uh, sorry, the iceberg, I beg your pardon. The iceberg with all, all of the energy, the living on, on the bit that's above water, yeah. but then all that work going on beneath that needs to go on beneath to move that evidence I into practice to making a change. And you mentioned that there are a few KT implementation strategies and the like. 
I know it might, it was a unique situation, COVID, and it was, you know, that, that opportunity to gather attention was probably unlike it ever been before or will be again. But did you learn anything from that experience of living evidence, constant searching, updating, and updating the guidelines and pushing that through down to the people using it yep. that can now carry over? Yeah. Um, we did, absolutely, and I, I absolutely and completely endorse Maureen's position. I find myself in a weird thing where I'm leading up two guidelines organisations, but I'm actually more interested in getting those guidelines into the hands of people who can use them or into whatever tool they're using than the guidelines themselves. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. COVID was very different, unprecedented. We were in the fortunate position that nobody knew what to do, so we weren't having to tell anybody that what they'd done for 25 years was wrong. It's much easier to implement when you don't have to disimplement. Um, but we absolutely did learn things. So one of the stories, um, we got a call on a Friday afternoon from one of our colleagues at New South Wales Health. Um, and he said, look, when you're gonna put out a newsletter, could you just give us a heads up? Like maybe a couple hours beforehand? And we said, yeah, okay, why, would, why is that? And he said, well, your newsletter came out yesterday afternoon um, recommending a new drug. Um, and by the time I'd gone to the medicine stockpile to order it for New South Wales, Victoria had already got all the stock. Um, now, that's not going to happen outside of COVID, but it just reinforced to me the importance of getting to the right people with the right information at the right time. And we had an uh, extraordinary comms team on COVID led by Eloise Hudson um, with Kayla. Um, and the value of comms expertise, uh, I, I was always... Um, sold on that, but now I'm an evangelist. Um, and the model, I think, of being able to, people could come back to us and say, you made that recommendation for that thing, um, but actually we can't get that thing. Uh, could you revisit that recommendation? And then we could go back to the ETD and say, okay, one of the issues is access. How are we going to overcome access for this recommendation? So I think that, that ongoing discussion does really make a big difference in COVID, but also beyond. Okay, fantastic. Some food for thought. We time for one final question, please. The, have the mic yeah. over there. <coughs> thanks, Zach, thanks, Tari. And firstly, just a huge thank you again to your team and the COVID-19 Task Force for all the work you did uh, for Australians and also the world developing those living guidelines, which really were a global good. So yeah, just thanks. huge admir admiration for you and the team. With living guidelines like that, uh, where you have your living panels, uh, your living consumer panels and your advisory groups that you talked about, but also your team, and they're really focusing on this topic again and again, doing the searches, discussing the same topic over and over again for potentially years, and particularly during COVID um, as well. Could you talk a little bit about how you managed your team, you prevented burnout and just kept the enthusiasm alive for so long and, your team and the panel and everything else from a human perspective? Yeah. Um, thanks, Zach. It really was a huge privilege to be a part of it. Um, it's interesting because we were really concerned about burnout for our panel members particularly. So these were very, um, uh, no, they were coal-faced clinicians who were going to work every day in the context of COVID in very stressful situations. They were often leading teams, very senior people in lots of cases. And we were asking them to meet with us every week and every now and then we'd think, um, okay, maybe we just give them a week off. <laughs> like, they could probably... And so we'd send an email out, like, we don't have anything pressing to discuss this week. Um, maybe take an hour off. And they'd be like, oh, no, can we still meet? Because I'd really like to talk about this other thing. Um, and we had that experience throughout. People, I think part of it's the COVID unprecedentedness. Everybody loved it. But part of it was also they built a community. They really enjoyed being part of a team that was doing this. And... Part of the process was learning about what other people were doing in other centres. and um, So the clinicians really loved it um, and we were surprised. We, we lost, I think, three clinicians from our 250 over the course of three years. Um, and I don't know that that necessarily translates to another situation. We'll, we'll find out. I think for the team... Um, so my, you know, my PhD was in clinical epidemiology, um, which four years ago nobody could had ever heard of, right? And then suddenly there were epidemiologists on our TV every day. Um, my dad didn't get it. He still thought I was an epidemiologist. I don't know what an epidemiologist <laughs> is. Um, but the fact that, the, you know, we often spend a year on a systematic review which goes out there and may or may not have any impact. 
But the guys who were running the evidence team, and shout out to Britta Tendall and Heath Wyatt and all the evidence synthesis team with them, um, they were seeing the impact of their work tomorrow. Yeah. And so the, the, you know, the value of that, I think, and many of them now have like gone, I need a month off <laughs> to decompress now. Um, but I think it was just a privilege to be in a position where, and it, you know, it was COVID, everybody was like, whatever I can do, I'll help. Um, and they are, we, we talk about inside, it was the best team ever. We really absolutely had the best team ever. Um, and I'm sure you've got great teams, but uh, it, it was just an extraordinary privilege for us all. And, and we'll learn over the next few years how that translates to other less pressured situations. Fantastic. I think knowing that you're making a difference can be a remarkable driving force. And I think yeah. the reality is that if we're all thinking about these things, we all have the opportunity to make that difference. It's just not in front of our faces. You know, the work that we're all, none of us, I assume, are in this room because this was the most profitable career choice we could make, right? Otherwise, we'd be working for Springer Nature. Um, but we all chose this job because we want to make an impact. And I think, you know, we were very privileged to be in a position where we could see that impact. But um, I think, uh, forgive me, I can't remember, was it you, Ruth, who said we need to have a, you know, a sticky note on our screens, which is like, what are you doing and why are you doing it that way? I think we also need to be like, reminding ourselves of why we're here. It's probably not about the paycheck. It's about the fact that we all want to make it, the world a better place for the clinicians that we serve and the patients that they serve. Absolutely. And I think that's a really magical place to finish this session. On that score, thank you everyone for your kind attention. Um, and Tari, thank you to you uh, for being a, a part of our program. That was a wonderful presentation. Pleasure. This is uh, straight to the pool room for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. Trade. Thank you so much. Thank Please you. join me in thanking Tari one more time.